So I'm continuing here from part one of our look at the history of light in scientific thought. Having studied medicine in London, Edinburgh, Gottingen and Cambridge, Thomas Young bought a house in London with money left him by a wealthy uncle and set up practice there. From 1811 to the time of his death, he served as a physician at St. George's Hospital. His main medical interest, though, wasn't in treating patients, but in doing research. Human vision and the mechanisms of the eye held a special fascination for him. As early as 1790 or thereabouts, barely out of school, Young had hatched the original theory of how colour vision comes about, building on work by Newton. Through his experiments with prisms back in 1672, Newton showed that, rather surprisingly, ordinary white light is a thorough blend of all the rainbow colours from red to violet. Objects have a particular hue, Newton realised, because they reflect some colours more than others. A red apple is red because it reflects rays from the red end of the spectrum and absorbs rays from the blue end. A blueberry, on the other hand, reflects strongly at the blue end of the spectrum and absorbs the red. Thinking about Newton's discovery, Young concluded that the retina at the back of the eye couldn't possibly have a different receptor for each type of light because there was a continuum of colours from red to violet. There was no way there could be such a vast number of specific receptors. Instead, he proposed that colours were perceived by way of a simple three-colour code. As artists knew well, any colour of the spectrum, except white, could be matched by judicious blending of just three colours of paint. Young suggested that this three-colour code wasn't an intrinsic property of light, but arose from the combined activity of three different, as he called them, particles in the retina, each sensitive to different parts of the spectrum. In fact, we now know that colour vision depends on the interaction of three types of cone cells, one especially sensitive to red light, another to green light, and a third to blue light. Considering that Young set out his three-colour theory before cone cells had been discovered, he came remarkably close to the truth. While still a medical student at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, Young also discovered how the lens of the eye changes shape to focus on objects at different distances. In 1801, just after his move to London, he showed that astigmatism results from an abnormally shaped cornea. At the age of only 28, Young was already Professor of Natural Philosophy at the Royal Institution and lecturing on just about everything under and above the sun – acoustics, optics, gravitation, astronomy, tides, electricity, energy – he was the first to give the word energy its scientific meaning – climate, animal life, vegetation, capillary attraction of liquids and the hydrodynamics of reservoirs, canals and harbours. His epitaph in Westminster Abbey says it all. A man alike eminent in almost every department of human learning. It was Young's work on optics that eventually made him famous and a heretic in his own land. Having pioneered physiological optics, it was only a short step to considering the fundamental essence of light. And in that fateful year of 1801, Young turned his mind to light's basic nature. His interest in this question was piqued by some work he'd done in the mid-1790s on the transmission of sound, which he came to believe was analogous to light. Sound was made of waves, Young suspected that light was too. So in 1802 he devised an experiment to put this theory to the test. If light were made of waves, then from a narrow opening in its path it should head out as a series of concentric circular ripples. To grasp this idea, imagine a long rectangular trough of water. Halfway down the trough is a barrier with a small hole in it. Straight, parallel waves, like the lines of waves marching toward a shore before they break, are created by moving a plank of wood back and forth at one end of the trough. When a wave reaches the barrier, it's stopped dead in its tracks, except for at the small hole. This opening serves as a new source of waves, but of expanding circular waves, as if a pebble had been dropped into the water at that point. On the side of the tank beyond the barrier, the secondary waves fan out, circles within circles. 
Now suppose there are two little holes in the barrier across the tank. Both act as sources of circular waves. What's more, these waves are exactly in step, in phase, to use the scientific description, because they've come from the same set of waves that arrived at the barrier. As the circular waves spread out from the two holes, they run into one another and interact. They interfere. Where two crests or two troughs coincide, they combine to give a crest or trough of double the height. Where a crest meets a trough, the two cancel out to leave an undisturbed spot. Drop two pebbles of equal size close together in a pond and you'll see an instant demonstration. The result is an interference pattern. Thomas Young carried out the equivalent of this water wave interference experiment using light. In a darkened room, he shone light upon a barrier in which there were two narrow parallel slits within a fraction of an inch of each other. Then he looked at the outcome on a white screen set further back. If light were made of particles, as Newton claimed, the only thing showing on the screen ought to be two bright parallel lines where the light particles had shot straight through. On the other hand, if light, like water, were wave-like, the secondary light waves spreading out from the two slits should create a pattern of alternate dark and light bands where the light from the two sources respectively cancelled out and were amplified. Young's result was literally black and white, a series of interference bands. His double slit experiment argued powerfully in favour of the wave model of light. Flushed with success, Young used his proof of the wave character of light to explain the beautiful shifting colours of thin films, such as those of soap bubbles. Relating colour to wavelength, he also calculated the approximate wavelengths of the seven colours of the rainbow recognised by Newton. In 1817, he proposed that light waves were transverse. In other words, they vibrate at right angles to the direction in which they travel. Up to that time, supporters of the wave theory of light had assumed that, like sound waves, light waves were longitudinal, vibrating along their direction of motion. Using his novel idea of transverse waves, Young was able to explain polarization as the alignment of light waves so that they vibrate in the same plane. For these breakthroughs, Young ought to have been hailed as a wunderkind, a youthful genius who set physics on its head, but he'd had the audacity to challenge the authority of Newton in the great man's own domain, and that didn't go down well. A savage anonymous review of Young's work in 1803 in the Edinburgh Review, now known to have been by Lord Henry Broom, a big fan of the corpuscular theory, cast Young into scientific limbo for at least a decade. Newton had been dead 80 years when Young officially published his findings on interference in 1807, but the godlike status of the great man in Britain meant that Young's compelling results were pretty much ignored by his compatriots. Instead, it fell to a Frenchman, Augustin Fresnel, to persuade the world a few years later through a series of demonstrations that were more comprehensive than those of Young, that light really was a series of waves and not a movement of minuscule particles. By the end of the 19th century, when Léon Foucault, another French physicist, showed that contrary to the expectations of Newton's corpuscular theory, light travelled more slowly in water than in air, the wave picture of light was firmly established. All that remained was to clear up some details. If light consisted of waves, what was the nature of these waves? What exactly was waving? The story continues in part three. <laughs>